light bulb around the pandemic went on for me pretty early in March. Um, I had a call from one of the heads of TA who basically said, I just want to share with you that uh, we're, we stopped hiring. I've now been tasked to oversee the furloughing, if you will, of workers. And three days from now, we'll announce. So it's not to be, you know, shared right now. We will announce that we're furloughing 125,000 workers. And you could hear the pain in her voice because she, she was used to celebrating how we hire people and bring them on board and give them new opportunities and all of that. That's, that's our condition as recruiters. This, this, uh, this shift, this pivot is not the kind of thing we really like. Recruiters don't like telling bad people bad news. It's another reason why we ha we're so shitty about, <laughs> uh, about candidates that aren't, we're not going to go forward with. Welcome to Total Picture Media and another edition of WTF 2020, an influencer's guide to navigating the shit show. My name is Peter Clayton. Thank you for tuning in. So what's your opinion of 2020 so far? Here's mine. Right, silly little Peter, on route two, coming right up. Between COVID-19, climate change, Black Lives Matter, our political shit show, a government in complete disarray with no leadership, no conscience, no integrity, no honesty, we're adrift in a sea of daily, what happened now? Is it every man, woman, and child for themselves? It sure feels like it. The fucking Titanic is sinking, and we're all on it. I think the group of influencers, thought leaders, subject matter experts, innovators, and visionaries I've invited to participate in this series can give all of us some inspiration, a renewed sense of purpose, or at least some hope. Today, I'm delighted to welcome back to Total Picture Media my good friend Jerry Crispin. Jerry is a self-described lifelong student of hiring with a passion for conversations about how every stakeholder in the recruiting process finds meaningful work, technology and data that contribute to employer and candidate decisions, and organizational strategy for talent management that is sustainable. He is the co-founder of Career Crossroads, established in 1995, a consultancy that nurtures a growing community of world-class talent acquisition leaders. In 2010, Jerry helped establish the Talent Board and the Candidate Experience Awards and has been instrumental in the creation of the Association for Talent Acquisition Professionals, ATAP. So Jerry, thank you so much for taking time to join me today here on Total Picture Media. It sure is great to see you. How has the 2020 dumpster fire impacted you personally, uh, other than the <laughs> fact that you just spent $8,000 removing trees from your yard. <laughs> well, you know, 2020 has been an extraordinary time. So th thank you for coming and asking. I think, uh, you know, it, you know, as a, as somebody who's 73 uh, and been around a long time on the half empty glass you know, I have to be hunkered down until until it's all over. So there's a sadness that my, you know, I'm not traveling 100,000 miles a year. But I, I had also recognized I needed to cut back anyway, but not not from 100,000 to zero. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no shit. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, so it's been... Um, but, you know, but I also, you know, since the 90s, I've been working from home. So over 20 years, you know, I have a home office. Um, I'm very comfortable with it. I engage people on a regular basis every single day. <laughs> a lot of people actually return my calls. So, 
So if I feel lonely, I can certainly give a call to somebody and have a conversation. And so I'm, I'm kind of self, um, uh, self-contained self in relation to that. Uh, it's a little harder for my wife, who has to put up with me now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I thank her every day. Uh-huh. For uh, you know, for all of that, I'm married 49 years uh, this year. So, you know, I I have very little to complain about, um, and every day um, is a blessing from my perspective. Uh, so, so the pandemic really has had very little effect on me personally from an attitude point of view. Physically, uh, obviously, there's a whole host of things that I can't do. Um, and a few things that I've, I've figured out with workarounds. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of where I am. I will say, so the one quick story is every uh, Monday at 4.30 a.m., I get up and drive 80 miles to my house on Long Island from where I live in New Jersey. And that's a house that my daughter is uh, buying from me. And behind that house is a platform on which I have an airstream. And uh, that airstream is, um, I, I go in, I sleep for another couple hours. If it's going to be a good day, I'm probably going to play golf with some of my um, cousins. Uh, but I do air hug my grandkids who play in the backyard, who are 11 and 10. I set up my office if I'm not playing uh, golf and and work during the day pretending that I'm on the road, <laughs> which is wonderful. And then uh, at the end of the day, um, I have a I have a drink uh, with with a couple of my cousins because there's another six six homes owned by cousins uh, on the same block. Um, we social distance appropriately. And then I play, I play poker until one o'clock in the morning with eight cousins, all of whom are similar, similarly in their sixties or yeah, I think one of them just hit 70. Um, and all of us are, are hunkered down. Uh, so we know that if, if any of us get it, we'll probably kill all the rest of us. And so we're pretty careful about that. But we've been playing poker together since 1985. Wow. And (laughs) then I come back to my Airstream because I don't want to drive home in the middle of the night anymore. I sleep for about four hours and then get up and drive home. (laughs) So, So every Monday is like I'm back on the road kind of thing. Oh, that's great. That is great. So, so uh, for those viewers who may not be familiar with Career Crossroads, which you co-founded, I believe, like in 1995, give us a, a brief synopsis of what your company does. Well, it's our 25th year, and obviously the, the, the first few years was really focused in on creating content books, if you will, and directories in print, no less. Um, around the impact of um, emerging technology on recruiting. What an interesting idea. And and somewhere around 2001, we pivoted, uh, recognizing that that approach uh, was not as much fun as uh, what was starting to be something we thought was important. And that is the ability for people in a trusted environment to be able to engage each other, practitioners particularly. So Career Crossroads is a community of talent acquisition leaders and leadership teams in very large companies. And and more importantly, um, they're folks that uh, basically involve four characteristics that are important to me. Otherwise, I'm not interested in having them as members. So it's a membership uh, community. They are passionate about recruiting. They're compelled to improve. They have critical thinking skills, so can engage one another in a positive way. 
And finally, uh, they're willing to share unconditionally. And so today, uh, Career Crossroads is primarily virtual, right? We've pivoted from uh, face-to-face meetings that occurred every month, just about, um, as well as a lot of conversation and then some online content. But now, all of the interaction is is virtual. So we're we have um, meetings literally two or three each week that range from an hour. Actually, they're now ranging from fifteen minutes. We just had a meeting yesterday called Expertise. It was the first time we're doing that. And we're interviewing a series of experts, some practitioners, some uh, who are not practitioners, but certain issues. Uh, And we had 60 of our members show up. So we have 150 members total. We had 60 of our members come in for 15 minutes uh, to hear one of our members talk about a a particular practice that they're using uh, that people are interested in. And and the longest meetings are about two and a half hours uh, that are heavily engaged in interaction between our members. So it's not about me or Chris Hoyt, my business partner, um, or Shannon Pritchett, who now uh, works with Career Crossroads. Oh, she does. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Shannon joined us. Actually... This this is uh, her one year anniversary. That's great. And uh, so so I have I basically have someone who's twenty five years younger than me running the company, and some somebody ten years younger than him, uh, who's kind of you know in line. So my succession plan's done, and I just <laughs> uh, show up and enjoy life. Um, so we have we have literally. Um, between two and 3,000 people, if you count all those leadership teams of the 150 companies who are talking to each other every month online. Our content is curated not by me, by, by our members. So it's a matter of how we organize that content to be searchable and engaging and useful for the, the folks. So we keep... We have an awful lot of um, developed approaches and practices to keep our members aware of what's happening right now with each other. And and people are hungering for that. This This is a time in which people have to make decisions under extreme circumstances. Uh, you know, from a, from a (laughs) extreme uncertainty is really the, the point. So, so if you're making decisions under, un, under conditions of extreme uncertainty, uh, one of the things you kind of hunger for is, well, this is what I'm going to be doing. What are you going to be doing? <laughs> and, and, and we're providing basically a platform for folks to be able to do that. That's really interesting. You know, as you mentioned, you have 150 members yep. who are predominantly with very large Fortune 500 companies. So yeah, they collectively they hire between two and three million people a year. Wow. Or or did did yeah. <laughs> so w- what are you hearing from your members now, Jerry, um, regarding you know, their outlook for 2021? I think the light bulb around the pandemic went on for me pretty early in March. Um, I had a call from one of the heads of TA who basically said, I just want to share with you that uh, we're, we stopped hiring. I've now been tasked to oversee the furloughing, if you will, of workers and three days from now we'll announce. So it's not to be, you know, shared right now. We will announce that we're furloughing 125,000 workers. And you could hear the pain in her voice because she she was used to celebrating how we hire people and bring them on board and give them new opportunities and all of that. That's, that's our condition as recruiters. This, this, uh, this shift, this pivot is not the kind of thing we really like recruiters don't like telling bad people bad news it's another reason why 
we ha we're so shitty about <laughs> uh, about candidates that aren't we're not going to go forward with. Um, but but what that told me is that people uh, really were going to be heavily engaged in um, in, in a whole set of uh, activities, some of which might end up being themselves, and and several of our members probably will not be able to renew for next year because there's nobody left. If you yeah. think about it, what 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 would you do if you're, I don't know, United Airlines, and you lay off nine thousand people at the end of September? Um, all of whom, by the way, probably are not going to get another job anytime soon because it's kind of a unique job. And in terms of being an airline stewardess or steward or, you know, any number of different kinds of things. And by the way, the other airlines aren't hiring either. Um, and, and when, when is the next time you're going to start hiring? Well, you're not going to really be starting to hire at some point. You're going to start bringing those people back. Well, how long is that going to take? So who wants to go work for United Airlines right now? And, and even if you did, you know, do you think they're going to have, be posting many jobs? Well, not, not really. So you don't really need any of those lots of people. So, so for some time now, the leaders of talent acquisition have left uh, there. And, and do you need to spend time, uh, you know, paying uh, for a community that, um, so that's not going to happen either. So we, we've, we've had a few of those. There's no question about that. And, and we've had a number of folks who've joined us in part because they, they want to engage their peers. And there are other peer communities as well. And I just encourage folks to, to participate in ways that give them the kind of information that allow them to think critically about what they're doing, knowing what other people might be doing, not copying, but, but obviously be inspired by people who care about improving what they do. How has the dynamics of your meetings changed? I mean, you've, you know, as you mentioned for years, you've had these colloquiums with your members every month and now everything is virtual online. Yeah. Um, how, how <laughs> Would I rather that... break bread. So yeah, you know, if I had my druthers, I love to break bread. I think that the most extraordinary experience that takes place in most of our lives has to do with over, <laughs> over, over food. I mean, the best conversations, the good most wine. interesting, <laughs> yes, well, good wine is, is just a part of it. And Gallo is one of our members that I happen to love. So they, um, they are very supportive of us. We had a, um, a leadership meeting several weeks ago with about 60 uh, of our members and the heads of TA from those organizations. And the idea being to have a, a conversation. So we, we thought, well, before we get into some exercises where people can talk about what's, um, what's critical to them now and what they're doing about it, because again, it's not about me speaking, it's about them engaging one another. So, so we find many different ways to facilitate that conversation in small groups, large groups, et cetera. We can do that face to face, but we can also do it <clears throat> virtually. And, but we thought, well, let's, let's have more of a <clears throat> break the bread kind of approach. So we work with Gallo to send <laughs> uh, a half a case of wine to each of the 60 liters of different wines that in, in their better, from their better vineyards and had two sommeliers. Well, that's a perk. And <laughs> yeah, but, <clears throat> but you know what? It was less, it was less expensive than taking 60 people to dinner 
at yeah. a top at a top restaurant right. in whatever uh, town we're in, where you need a private room for sixty people. That's not cheap. Uh, we don't do it by giving people box lunches and sending them off to the side. We, we do it by going to the best restaurant in whatever place we are. Well, we can't do that now. So, so we thought that this would be a way to kind of engage one another and in, enjoy the camaraderie, if you will, and learn something about, about wines for those people who imbibe in adult beverages. And and we had a ball and we had we had a couple people that don't drink you know they they took their wine gave it to a friend um but they enjoyed the learning and they enjoyed the camaraderie back and forth and the conversations began uh, just fairly very naturally after a couple of glasses of wine uh about about a whole variety of things that that people want to talk about and that went on for hours That's and, cool. and and so i'm i'm just saying there are things you can do if you're innovative and creative and you understand what your basic values are that you could do online as well as offline you can be honest and uh, forthright and transparent and engaging, if you will, online as well as face to face. But you know, there is there is a nuance that makes it easier. Um, it it helps that you've had a lot of face to face meetings with some of the same, most of the same people, right? Right. So that there's a there's a connection already, and you're simply. Uh, enhancing that connection uh, using using um, virtual means, but but eventually, yeah, I think you know uh, when when this is all over, we need to get back to some level of face to face because there was such learning when we would go to different each uh, meeting that we had was hosted by a different member. So being able to go to Nike's. Um, uh, campus in Portland, for example, um, is 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 really a learning event for anyone who who's never been there, and trying to understand what their how they create and and uh, enhance the culture that they're trying to to deal with from their from their employment brand point of view, and often it stimulates ideas for other folks in terms of how they think about what they do. So, so I love, I, I love both versions of what we're doing. I know that we'll be more balanced, probably virtually. We'll be working a lot harder to create different kinds of virtual experiences that fit the frame of what we value, which is members engaging each other with transparency and trust about the how people will respond that if you share the vulnerability of what isn't working in your organization it's not going to show up in the wall street journal and you're probably going to get some good suggestions from smart sharp bright people who who care about your success as much as their own um and and so Finding that, building that kind of a community is, has always been my aspiration, and and I think we've we've achieved uh, a pretty good portion of that. Uh, I'm never satisfied, uh, nor is Chris, nor is nor is Shannon, nor is Barb. Um, we we constantly are attempting new things, and sometimes those new things are going like. Well, that one that one didn't work as well as we'd like, but but we keep looking at it from the point of view of how our members uh, respond to each other, not to us. Well, speaking about conferences, uh, you know, as someone who used to show up at virtually every conference that had to do with HR or talent acquisition, um, I'm sure you've been asked to speak at virtual events. Um, what has that 
been for you and and how have you responded to participating in in virtual events other than ones that uh, that your company has hosted? What, what do you think about yeah, this? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's a tough time for conferences right no now. No shit. Jesus. Yeah. Not because you can't have them, because there's a lot of them. And I've been to, I don't know, 20 during the course of the last six, seven months. Um, and either... And and for the most part, been part of a panel or or uh, facilitated a panel. Um, I, I I've kind of put away giving giving talks at this point. Um, I'd much rather highlight or enhance what people are doing right now. So I have plenty of members that can speak. Uh, eloquently about what they're trying to accomplish and and openly and honestly and those that are in that position to do that I tr- I look for you know putting them on on various panels and uh, and and hopefully elevating and moving the needle on on our space so I love doing that but um, the conferences. It aren't certainly making any money for the people who are putting them on. Uh, they may be getting goodwill from that, um, but they're certainly not covering <laughs> their nut. <laughs> I am absolutely sure of that. Um, I and I wish them well in trying to figure out how to monetize conferences, uh, virtual conferences in the future. It's just not going to be. It's not going to be easy. I will say that the conference that uh, ATAP did, which is, you know, the Association of Talent Acquisition Professionals and is a nonprofit, which was also free for everyone. Um, The advantage it had was that the people who did all of the work all did it pro bono. So, you know, uh, and, and thankfully, you know, thank them. It's good. That's part of their commitment to the profession. So there was no cost for that. And the res- and the and the outcome was, I believe, some ninety um, new members, each of which paid a uh, hundred bucks, which you know is inexpensive, uh, 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 you know, in terms of that. But it did two things: one, uh, that's nine thousand dollars that they made, plus it it enhanced. Um, the strength, the relationship between ATAP and a number of sponsors that do pay a bit more um, in order to support the growth of uh, a professional association that's trying to, you know, get to the next level. And and so that worked, um, but it certainly wouldn't be a moneymaker for for most, you know, professional conferences. So, so I, I'd love to see how that's going to be over the next uh, year or so. I, I like some of it. I think, um, I think I struggle when I see uh, glitches in the technology in terms of how you put people onto a stage um, and give them the tools to maybe show part of a deck or show themselves in different ways. But I, I do think the technology is improving. And so this pandemic will force all of this stuff uh, to get better and better. There's no question about that. I do think that the people who are behind the scenes uh, as attendees, um, it's a, I think it's a mistake because if I'm on stage and speaking with my panel, I get to see my panel and I get to see myself uh, and maybe my deck at best. But you know what? I want to see the audience. I look at the audience. I I get um, energy from the audience, and and if I'm fully engaged with the panel, I can't be. I I don't have the skill to multitask well enough to then automat read. You know anybody anybody's writing on the right hand side. I have to I have to shift off the visual into the reading part. And I can't do that. I want to, I'm, I'm really not looking for 
their comments. I'm looking for the energy that they supply, their their sense of engagement, their their hanging on on a panelist's word, and that helps me guide the panelists to you know shift off this topic and onto the next one kind of thing. So there's there's I think still a lot that we need to learn. And I will I will tell you that in the meetings that I run, I require that the people who attend show themselves. So you can't you have to everyone who doesn't show themselves, we ask, why aren't you showing yourself? And if they have a good enough excuse, we'll, we'll let it happen. But if there's 60 people in the room, there's only three or four that I can't see. And that gallery view, I can see 25 at a time. So I can shift between two or three, two or three you know, visuals and see how people are engaging. And then I can put them into small groups and I can be in those groups and engage with them, uh, but also see how they're responding to the issues. So, so it's getting better. I think conferences are gonna have a, a tough issue. Uh, they're certainly going to, um, there's a monetary uh, piece to that. And I'm sure that many, many conferences have already lost a significant amount. And many of the people that work for them are no longer there. You know, the last time I saw you was uh, last December in Hoboken at EY, and you participated in oh, yeah. the um, boot camp that Stephen Rothberg and, and College Recruiters has every year. And I mean, to your point of being on a panel and seeing the audience and having the audience react to that panel and then your ability to react to the audience, mm -hmm. I mean, that was a perfect example. And Stephen isn't going to have um, his boot camp this December because he feels that there's no way to replicate the engagement that happens with his events uh, virtually. Yeah, he could do it on a, several of them on a smaller scale. So he could, there's some things that he could do. And we, we talk, we actually uh, cook together. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm part of a virtual group that every two weeks cooks an Italian meal. Really? And, and different, different people uh, lead. So last uh, a week and a half ago, I, I led uh, pasta puttanesca. And, and so a whole host of, of people, about 12 people, were involved in cooking pasta puttanesca at the same time uh, virtually. So, yeah, that's uh, – so I love Steve. He's doing, he's doing good work. Uh, fortunately, this is not what he does for – you know, doing conferences isn't what he does for a living. Um, and, I, and I'll tell you, the side issue is I get to meet people when I go to something like his. And I was blown away by the head of um, diversity for Ernst & Young at that, at that meeting. I wanted to do, because of the social unrest issues, I wanted to do a series of conversations uh, with panels um, on uh, fairness in recruiting. And, uh, and, and so I really wanted people who had voices but who are also members. So, because again, you know, my, my model is peers engaging one another. And Ernst & Young is a member, but I had not met their, their diver head of diversity. I've always been engaged with the, you know, the TA side. Uh, so, so he was able to join and uh, contribute. Um, and I really appreciated that. And so my, my point is, you know, you build relationships over the course of a long period of time. You meet people in various places. And if you focus in on the people that you meet who who have a voice, and it may not be one that you agree with, but they have a voice and care about, you know, what that voice is, and they can support themselves, you know, with, with point by point, those are the kinds of folks you want to build relationships with. You know, and and I think a lot, a lot of our 
professional friends sometimes um, they're more interested in 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 uh, other variations on that relationship that don't don't always uh, work out. But you know, for me, lifelong, I get to learn a lot from an awful lot of people, and that that's one of the reasons why I love going to these conferences is to be able to hear and learn something from everybody who's there. When do you think in-person conferences will return and that people will actually show up and sponsors and vendors and... Well, um, come up with a, a really good vaccine and, and doesn't kill the first 200,000 people who take it. Because I, I suspect I'm not I'm not among the first uh, you know folks who are going to be in line. Um, so whoever whoever needs it first will get it, and uh, and probably within a few months uh, we'll we'll figure out what the problem is or the success of it is, and by then they'll have an, have made enough that uh, that I can get in line. And you know, go to the doctor and say, "Yeah, I'm old enough. I'm I'm next in line," kind of thing. So that's that's when I'm going. The you know, the day after I get a vaccine, or the day after they tell me that the vaccine is taken, or whatever, I'll be back on planes. I have no problem. I can't. You know, I'm not going to hide out um, with with fear, or whatever. I got my flu shot this week. <laughs> you know, oh. People get flu shots, uh, you know, so, so the, the answer to that is I would speculate that uh, by the end of 2021. So, so if I were planning, um, you know, the future, I would definitely um, put money on 2022 and uh, and then speculate on whether or not I should invest in in you know trying to jump the gun a little bit with something in the fall of 2021. Yeah, I don't think anybody in my in my era uh, working your way down is going to be excited about going to a crowded uh, venue um, anytime in 20. 2021 early on um i love the idea of um drive-ins <laughs> and right an experiment but you know these aren't money makers and they're not they, they really aren't the, the kind of thing where you can go over and hug somebody i i actually care about an awful lot of people and i like i like going up to them and hugging them I, and you know i can't do that i can't even do that with my grandkids so so especially my grandkids that you know who knows what the hell they've got so yeah. <laughs> so you know that used to give me colds every time i did uh engage them so you know i've i've been free of colds for for nine months now that's great <laughs> so back to uh your members for a minute i would sure. imagine i would imagine that a lot of them uh their employees are all working from home and they have found that that it actually does work they save money the employees are more productive they're happier uh so when do you think people are going to return to their offices if ever well they first of all it will happen but it will happen in a very different way in my opinion and and we're 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 totally focused on the fact that so many um companies like Facebook and, you know, Microsoft and whatever, they've all said, you know, don't, we're not going to come back until July of 2021 or fall of 2021. Most of them are already in that mode. And then many are declaring, uh, we'll never, you know, you'll always be able to um, be virtual. So, so when we get over this, though, there will be some thought about the advantages of what an office might look like that is, might be very different than where we are, right? Um, because you may need to prepare for the next pandemic. So I, I think that we'll see 
offices in a very different way. And certainly there are many jobs, labs, that people need to work together in a lab doing stuff that may not be amenable to virtual as well. Um, I do think that, you know, obviously the technology tools will continue to increase. So virtual capabilities of working as a team collectively will, will certainly improve. And, and I think the balance of how many days during the course of a week, a month, or a year that you are actually virtual will be significantly higher than it's ever been for those that you're capable of. But imagine <clears throat> that you love living in a city and you can now live in a city, but you can't afford to live in a city because you're young and you just graduated from college and all those things. And you got a job and it's a nice job, but the cost of you know, uh, an apartment is, is terribly high. So you've got two roommates in 800 square feet and the three of you only have two bedrooms. So that means you have to make up a couch every single night. You really want to work from home? Ain't going to happen. And so there's a whole host of people whose choices because of their lifestyle will be very different. Um, and we, we have in our head ourselves when we had children or, you know, when we moved to the suburbs or any number of things, but that's not everybody by a long shot. There's an awful lot of people who by and large grew up poor. They live in a tenement. They live in a, you know, a small block. They're still with their parents. They're living in their room, but they've got it. They've got a job that's getting them ahead. Where do they want to be? They want to be at the freaking job. <laughs> they don't want to be. <laughs> they, they don't want to, you know, have to deal with, you know, where right. they are. It's not a fun thing. Or, or maybe they're in an area that's uh, that's in the city, but but you know has been overlooked a bit. Uh, broadband doesn't work really well. There's loud noises of shit running by and everything else. Look, we, we, we tend to look at the world through our eyes. We need to look at the world through many other eyes of the people that we will hire in the next couple years. And so we're going to have to rethink everything um, so that we're not setting it up for old white dudes who like who like hanging out together and drinking together or whatever um you know it's just going to be a different it'll be a different world for sure but it's definitely not going to be all one way or the other so has this tectonic shift that we've just experienced this year going to impact jobs in talent acquisition? Are those jobs going to be more contract-based than full-time employees? What are you hearing from your members? And what well, that's, been the, that's been the, um, the trend anyway. I mean, the fact is we will evolve, continue to evolve talent acquisition from where we are to even more specialization, um, as well as upskill capabilities so that when we automate, we'll be able to be more efficient in terms of how we oversee the jobs that are open. Um, right now, I would suggest that uh, up until the pandemic anyway, if you looked at, uh, if you divided the number of people who are reporting to talent acquisition, they may be recruiters, but they may not be, right? They could be an analyst or they could be a, mar a recruitment marketer or they could be a, a TA operations person or any number of things, right? Right. So if you take all of those people and divide them into the total number of jobs filled in the course of a year, you're going to get a number. So, you know, the average TA professional is contributing to a uh, hundred hires a year, let's say, just for sake of argument. 
I don't think that number has changed in 25 years since before we, we, we had Personic or whatever. So, so what has the technology done to improve our ability uh, to be more efficient and more productive? And the answer to that is, well, we had other issues that we needed to deal with. And that had to do with the quality of what we were doing more than it did the, um, the numbers that we, we produced. Now, obviously, there's, there's differences in terms of some high volume recruiting activities, et cetera. But I think the next phase is automation for productivity. And, and a lot of things that can be automated, like scheduling, will be automated. And it's, to me, it's amazing that it hasn't already. But, but the fact is, uh, it hasn't. If you look at all of the different companies out there and how many people are devoted specifically to scheduling, even with all of the scheduling you know, technology out there, um, that's going to go away. All those people are going to go away. If your job was a coordinator in talent acquisition or working for, for the operations, not for talent acquisition, but involved in, in scheduling candidates and, and other kinds of things, that, that's not going to exist. They'll all be gone. And if you're a recruiter and all you did all day was interview from beginning to end. You know, somebody, somebody scheduled all these people in <laughs> and, right. and you spent all, you know, you spent 40% of your day, five days a week, interviewing candidates for the 23 openings that you currently, ha- uh, you know, have a schedule for, which you'll fill over the course of two to three months, depending upon where, when and where. And that adds up to 100 over the course of a year. You need another job because those things can be automated. I can do a better job um, with with automation in interviewing than you can. I can be more consistent. I can be perceived by the candidates as fairer, um, et cetera. And the same is true of, of asking why hiring managers should be hiring the business should hire and the business doesn't necessarily need the hiring manager other than ensuring that the needs of the hiring manager are in fact met or the the needs of the manager are met but i'd much rather invest in having managers learn how to manage than trying to keep track of how badly they actually do the hiring, which we, which where anybody's keeping track knows how badly uh, they do. That's where half, half, if not most of the unconscious bias becomes, becomes part of the problem rather than, rather than people who are trained well to to understand their unconscious bias um, and and make the efforts and behave and develop the behaviors that allow them to uh, hire for against the performance issues and rather than the demographic issues and and I think we have the we have the technology we have the tools we have the measurement capabilities um, to do all of those kinds of things and and what we need are extraordinarily strong um, talent advisors who can have equal discussions between them and the, and the managers to ensure that their needs are being met, as well as understand the business well enough to understand the gap between what the hiring manager wants and what the business will need over time in order to succeed. And then obviously we need this, perhaps some specialties related to how we then translate that into messages that attract the right people and repel the wrong people. Right. 
Yeah, and as you know, there are a lot of vendors out there, Jerry, working on AI and machine learning applications that actually take bias out of the interview and recruiting process. Um, they think they do. Yeah. There, there is no independent group that certifies that they've done what they say they've done. So right. you let me know when any one of them um decides that they aren't that that claiming <laughs> that I've done it uh equals having done it it just doesn't work that way so i would like to be able to test independently a a set of data that in fact uh it does do that now uh, granted i understand that algorithms can be developed around those kinds of issues. Everyone is working on them. And each of them says, my algorithm is the right algorithm. So they can't all be the right algorithm and they right. can't all be the same algorithm. So tell, tell me how they're building this, that standard. In a, so we're, we're, on a, we're on a path in the right direction. We still have a ways to go. Um, and the question is, uh, if you're replicating your, the ability to predict what the hiring manager would choose, then you're incorporating the bias of the hiring manager. If you, if you're pretty clear on the ability to one, understand what's underrepresented in that group. So if that job or job family is severely underrepresented from a gender point of view or from a racial point of view, then, then my interest is in creating a pool of candidates that includes sufficient qualified candidates from underrepresented groups that I can build a slate that will help move this needle so that our, our goal as a value for the business is to, is to look a little bit like the country, the region, the people that we sell to. I mean, if that's true, if you're, if you don't give a shit and you just you're okay with just uh, just the old white dudes, then we can do the same thing we've always done. But if you're if you're really engaged in saying I I need to move the needle, then that means you need to be hiring uh, that underrepresented group in a proportion greater than the proportion in which they're leaving <laughs> that group, right? That means you need to know what the proportion is. And then you need to stack the slate at a slightly higher level than that proportion. And expect that on average, if everybody is equally you know, qualified to do the job, that the selection over time would be, would be at least at that proportion, right? And then, and then we're, we're doing something. I, I got to tell you, I know no company right now that has their act together that well. And, and I know no company that would even uh, admit to that. But, but everybody is starting to think like that. And, and I think we have the potential to get there if we as a group, as an as a industry, begin talking about this, whether awkwardly or not, um, and saying, well, what do we need in order to do that? Well, you know, as a recruiter, um, if you trust me, if you've trained me properly, if I have all the skill sets, then I should be able to push a button and see what the representation is of any of the groups in my organization. That data should be accessible to me and available to me. I should be able to push a button and have an inference of the current pool of candidates that, that my group has put together for this job. And I should see what the representation of race, gender, et cetera, is within that group. 
most company, half the companies at least won't even consider giving a recruiter that. But the recruiter is still held accountable for building a, a diverse slate. So we need to change the, the headset to say, if this is our value and this is our focus and these are our approaches to how we want to move forward, then we need to empower the people who are doing the work and then hold them accountable for delivering against that work. And then if I deliver a 40% slate, diverse slate, over to 100 different um, hiring, ma hiring managers today, um, I'd like to push a button and see what their selection was by comparison. Was it 40%? Yeah. You know, should it be, what is the probability that it would be 5% and not an institutional bias, systemic bias being operating, let alone an individual unconscious bias operating? So we, we have the ability not only to do those things, but to use data and statistics to pinpoint where our problems are and then work on our damn problems but many companies won't even do the calculations, won't even do the work to, to find out whether there's a disparity in pay between women or in race in the given job. They won't even do the calculation because they're afraid of being held accountable for, for it. And I'm going, hold yourself accountable. Go make it happen now. Show that you're doing change. Then you can defend yourself. You know, so... I think we're coming into an era where these kinds of conversations will move the needle, but what it will take is getting beyond an individual corporation and have many corporations step up and say, this is what we need to do in order to call ourselves a legitimate recruiting function. And if you're not doing these things, don't call yourselves a recruiter. Yeah, but it it requires the C-suite to buy into all of this for oh, sure. this to happen. I can I can leverage the yeah. You, you, the answer is it's so much easier if the C-suite is is leading the way, right? Because right. because shit rolls down. Yeah. But but I got to tell you, there are eventually the C-suite gets educated if in fact they get sued if in fact uh, it costs them more, if they get fired. And, and in the last couple of years, there have been plenty of people at the C-suite who've lost their jobs over uh, these kinds of biases, if you will, uh, or harassment or whatever it might be. So if, if we as, the, as individuals step up the C-suite will listen. If we're if we're just if we're just following orders, then we'll continue just following orders. But I don't, you know, I don't believe in that. But on the other hand, I don't work for a company either. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so I I appreciate the fact that people need to put food on the table, that they're raising kids, etc. And if they work for an abusive boss or an abusive organization they kind of look the other way. If there's systemic bias built in the hiring process, and there's plenty of that, um, they look the other way because the cost of stepping up to that is painful, it's long-term, it's hard, and you might not win. And, and I think that we need to arm people to do it collectively. And that's kind of what I'm, that's, that's my next mission for the next, uh, two, three, four years that I, I think I still have enough energy and interest uh, to push forward. That's cool. So um, one more question for you, and I appreciate your time. Uh, I noticed uh, on your website that you have a, a book club and yeah. that, that anyone can participate. Yeah. Um, and a recent title is The Buddha and the Badass. Yes. So, so tell us about this book and why you uh, selected it. 
we we actually had our last meeting on Buddha and the Badass. Um, I did not select it. It was uh, kind of a combination of people who said, you know, we'd join a book club, and I said, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm in. Uh, Buddha and the Badass is another one of those uh, kind of business motivational books about how to sort of how to use Zen and um, and transparency and a variety of other things to be able to um, move your life forward and your business forward and have a kind of a blended sense that how you operate in life, um, you know, makes sense. What I love about the book is that at the end of each chapter, there's a summary. So if you really want a shortcut, you can shortcut. What I would criticize about the book is that the author, who is a young entrepreneur who's very successful, um, he, his uh, use of the first uh, person um, patting on the back approach is not as subtle as it should be. Um, and violate some of the very principles by which he's telling everybody to operate. <laughs> um, and, and it became clear to me somewhere around chapter six, where suddenly he discovered this thing called um, Maslow's hierarchy um, and spent an entire chapter, you know, evolving his version of that. And I'm going, he clearly never never went to psych 101 <laughs> <laughs> he discovered it a little bit late in life yeah, yeah i didn't read any uh, chip Connolly's books yeah, yeah you know it's uh <laughs> been there done that you know uh, in fact i've lived it so i'm not a motivational book guy at all I, I want to. I want to tell you. I tried to get the book club to to do this one. It's called God Level Knowledge Darts: Life Lessons from the Bronx by Jesus and Mero. So I just started reading this, and it's it's off the wall, totally off the wall. Uh, two these two black guys who are doing um, extraordinary uh, interviews. So you would like this. I, I would. They are, and they're very real, and they're very transparent, and they talk about a number of different issues from from their their window, and uh, and they're very articulate about that in interesting ways. Very funny. I I read uh, literally an hour every night before I go to bed, so so I I can get through a couple books a month, and. And I can I can scan a Buddha and the badass. I, I, <laughs> I actually was was really uh, interested in the first first chapter, two chapters, and then began scanning more as I realized that he was repeating himself and getting engaged in a, a variety of different things. So it it's an important concept that we all must have: is how do you? What is the context of your life? Uh -huh. that you've chosen. If you haven't done that, then yes, you should do that. And this was important to me when I was in my 20s. But, but you know, I'm 73. And uh, most of what he's talking about is what you could be doing in order to be successful. Well, you know what? I've had a good run. I'm, uh, by my definition, I've been successful for a lot of, <laughs> for, for a long, long time. But my definition isn't, you know, in terms of money, it's in right. terms of relationships about the people that I care about, whether I stay in touch with them, those kinds of things. And I, I resolved that issue many, many years ago. And so I do tell people that every two years at the, at the least, you need to sit back, take stock and see whether or not your job in the context of the career that you want is aligned. And whether the the career that you want is aligned to your life, and if you can do those things periodically, you know you can always begin to recalibrate. But if you fail to do that and you just wander, 
then you're going to find that uh, that there's a big gap between uh, where you are and where you you know believe you want to be. And I don't, I don't care what method you use, Buddha the badass or whatever, <laughs> to do it. Uh, you you need to have you need to take stock, and and it's as it's as simple as that, and it's as difficult as that. It's like playing golf. You need to have a mental image of how how you're going to swing, you know, um, and so that you can keep doing it in a consistent way. One last thing: anything you would like to share that we haven't covered in our conversation this morning? No, other than stay safe. <laughs> uh, be well. Uh -huh. um, and pay it forward. I think uh, I was in a meeting yesterday and talking about, you know, how we can be more helpful to those folks who are looking for jobs. And uh, so we, we went through a whole series of different ways that people uh, could improve their job seeking approach and everything else. But I said that, you know, if you're looking for a job every day, you should take at least a few minutes to help someone else looking for a job. I said it will get you out of whatever tendency you have to get depressed about the fact that you don't have a job. It will make you feel positive that you're sharing your experience, your emotions, your whatever with someone else in a positive, constructive way. Um, and so the, the, the return on that is, is so valuable that, that I suggest that every single day is important for everyone to think about how they pay something forward. Um, and I'm just a, a strong believer in that. Um, I make a point of doing it myself. Um, and, and I find that, um, it, it helps to ground me in ways that I would not find otherwise. Well, you have certainly done that in our conversation and I truly appreciate it. And I really look forward to an opportunity to see you in person and, uh, we'll be in touch. Okay. Take care. You too.